Hello, everyone. Our church denomination, the Canadian Baptists of Ontario and Quebec, recognizes, like we do, the need for reaching the next generation. Along with the other youth leaders of the Canadian Baptists throughout Canada, its Next Generation Ministries wrote a booklet called Imaginative Hope, as you can see on the screen, reaching and engaging the next generation with the gospel. Now in this booklet, they present two important statistics for us to ponder. The first is this, 31% of the Canadian population is under the age of 24, showing that the young generations comprised almost one third of the total population in Canada. And here's an important statistic. 85% of Christians in Canada become a follower of Jesus between the ages of four and 14, showing the importance of children and youth ministries in our churches. This booklet also states that 10 million young Canadians are seeking meaning in their lives. They are desperately searching for a place to be loved, a place to be known, a place to belong. The implication of these two statistics is that we are to give intentional focus to children and youth right now, not later. Let me now address here the pastors and governing board leaders of our church. My friends, we need to prioritize our investment in children, youth, and family ministries. It is worth spending extra time, extra energy, extra resources on these generations right now so that they would not only be transformed by the gospel, but that they would become the next generation leaders in our church. Now, let me now talk to our parents with grown children and also to our grandparents. My friend, would you consider investing more time and investing more energy with your children and to intentionally pass on the baton of faith to your grandchildren, not only to your children? Sharing life, and spending time together is worth our investment. Building memories and faith together is worth more than gaining money for all of them. Now, let me now address our young couples, our young adults, and our youth in this church. We who are older than you, my friend, are committed to you. We are committed to your best. We are thinking of you of journeying with you, of serving with you. Please don't be afraid to grow in your faith or to even step out in faith in service and leadership development. But you may be wondering as a young person, what, me, a leader? Are you just kidding? If this has come to your mind, remember you, are never too young to be a leader. Let me mention 10 people who started young doing something significant in their life. Let me mention the first, Bill Gates. He started Microsoft at age 19. Albert Einstein wrote his first scientific paper at age 16. Steven Spielberg directed his first indie movie or film at age 16. Mark Zuckerberg launched Facebook at age 19. Steve Jobs launched Apple as a, at age 21. Going to the Bible, Josiah became king of Israel at age eight and became a person who reformed the nation at age 16. Seventh, George Williams started YMCA at age 23. Mother Teresa started work in India at age 19. John Wesley started the beginnings of the Methodist movement at age 17. And Desmond Love led kids to safety in Hurricane Katrina at age six. Now you're probably saying in your mind, but pastor, 
I'm not Steve Jobs. I'm not Albert Einstein. I'm not a Steven Spielberg or Mother Teresa. Of course you're not. And you don't have to be someone you're not. But just to have you being you and not someone else is becoming the kind of person God designed you to be. What I'm appealing to all of us is this. Whatever be your generation, whatever be your age, whatever be your stage in life, let us all be part of each other's life, of each other's faith, of each other's faith formation, and of each other's faith transmission. We all need to be part in passing the baton of faith well and wisely to the next generations. Today, we will learn how to leave a legacy that lasts long, based on 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Legacy is not just a topic of conversation for old people. It is an important issue for both old and young people. In 2 Timothy, Paul was already an old leader, talking to Timothy, who was a young leader then. They were addressing issues of legacy. In fact, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Paul touches on three ways to leave a legacy that lasts long. The first way is this. Minister with grace. We see this in chapter 2, verse 1. The ministry of Paul to Timothy is based on a close relationship as father and son. Note how Paul addresses Timothy in chapter 2, the first portion of verse 1. He says, you then, my son. He says the same thing at the introduction of this letter to Timothy. This is what he says in chapter 1, verse 2. To Timothy, my dear son. Even in, this first, in his first letter to Timothy in chapter 1, in verse 18, the first portion, Paul says, Timothy, my son. Does this mean that Timothy is the literal and physical son of Paul? No, he is not. We know this from Paul's introduction in his first letter to Timothy, which states, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. That's the difference, in the faith. In other words, Paul was the spiritual father of Timothy. Their spiritual relationship in the, in the ministry is very close, so close that Paul describes his intimacy in terms of the father and son relationship. Now, this close relationship in life and in their ministry together is anchored on the grace found in Christ Jesus. That's why in the first, that's why in one of his final instructions on legacy to Timothy, he commands him with these words. He says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, grace here refers to God's unearned favor. It is God's free gift. It is God's undeserved kindness, not based on our own merit at all. Grace is to be the mark of our close relationships as we minister to one another. As we are recipients of the grace of God found in Christ Jesus, we are to be strong in that grace, anchoring our relationships and our ministries. I'd like for us to note here that Paul emphasizes the importance of grace by mentioning it in his introductory greeting in this letter, also in his closing or final greeting in the same letter, and the link to Christ and the gospel in relation to grace. Let's look at these quickly. In verse, in this verses, we see in 2 Timothy, beginning with the introduction, chapter 1, verse 2, Paul says, as a greeting, look at the first word he uses, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Christ, our Lord. And then second, at the end of this letter, he says, The Lord be with your spirit. 
And again, he says, grace be with you all. And then we also see in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, the importance of grace in this letter. Paul says, he referring to God, has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose. And look at what follows next. Because of his grace. This grace has been given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, when we go to Paul's first letter to Timothy, grace again appears. We see it again in the opening greeting of chapter 1 and also in the final greeting in chapter 6 and how grace is given to Paul in abundance despite his violent past. Now, look at his verses as well. At the introduction of 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul again begins with grace. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Then when we go to the last part of the letter in chapter 6, Paul ends the, the chapter and the whole letter with grace be with you all. And then we also see this important words of how he was a recipient of grace in chapter 1. Even though his past was that he was a blasphemer or a persecutor and a violent man. Listen to how he was a recipient of grace. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Look at the next portion. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So we see here that Paul consistently says that grace is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need God's grace daily. We need grace in our relationships. We need grace in our ministries. This is what Paul does when he actually talked about Timothy. He was showing grace on behalf of Timothy. He treated Timothy graciously by speaking highly of him to the Philippians when they both serve God together. Listen to these words of Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Note this. He says, I have no one like him, referring to Timothy, who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But note here again, look at what he says. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Now, when I think of GCF in Peel, in York, and even in Alton, I am encouraged with the way these churches are ministering to the youth, the young adults, and building, building them up with grace in an ongoing relationship, even seeking to reach the other youth, not at GCF yet. Pastor John has been faithfully ministering to the youth and young adults at GCF Peel. And now God has raised James Kaba to also be ministering to these next generation. And James has been serving as a deacon at GCF Peel. Pastor Ferdy and Pastor James Dulanda are ministering to the youth in GCF Halton, GCF York, and hopefully in GCF Durham too, along with youth who are not yet part of GCF. I'm ministering to the young parents of GCF Peel, and Pastor Marvin is ministering to the young adults and young couples at GCF York. My friends, let's minister to the next generations and engage them with grace. So far, we've seen that the first way to leave a legacy that lasts is to minister 
with grace. The second way to do it is to mentor with depth. We see this in verse 2. Now, the mentoring with depth is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And what I'd like for you to note as I read this verse for you is that it shows mentoring covering four generations. Look at these four generations as I read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 to you. Paul says, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Note, the first generation is Paul himself as he addresses Timothy. The second generation is Timothy, the, the pastor that he's entrusting the ministry to. The third is made up of the reliable people that Timothy must be entrusting the gospel and sound doctrine to. And the fourth is the others who are also going to be taught by the reliable people. Four generations. Please also note the faithful pattern here. Paul entrusts to Timothy what has been previously entrusted to Paul so that Timothy can guard these things and entrust these same things to others as well. Let's see the unfolding of this pattern using the different verses in 2 Timothy and even 1 Timothy. We see that Paul entrusts his life. Paul entrusts his future in the hands of God. We see this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, the last portion. Paul says, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he, referring to God, is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. The second, we see the continuation of the pattern. God entrusts his gospel and sound doctrine to Paul after Paul entrusts to God his life, his future in the hands of God. We see this entrusting to Paul of the gospel and sound doctrine in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, and also in verse 11. Paul said, sound doctrine that confirms or that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God. Look at what follows next, which he entrusted to me. God entrusted to Paul the sound doctrine that is conformed to the gospel. Look at the third part in the pattern. Now, after having been entrusted by God, Paul asks Timothy to guard what Paul has entrusted to Timothy. We see this in the following verses. First Timothy, this is what Paul says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Here's another command to guard what has been entrusted. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And then here's the fourth part of the pattern. Timothy, who is supposed to guard what has been entrusted to him, has to do this next. He is to entrust the same things, the gospel, the, the, the sound doctrine, the same deposit that is good, that is of sound doctrine to the others who will also teach the same things to others as well. This is what the main point of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, this spiritual mentoring by Paul in relation to Timothy is similar to the family mentoring by Lois and Eunice to Timothy. As we previously saw, this family mentoring in three generations found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, which says, I am reminded, Paul says, of your sincere faith, the sincere faith of Timothy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. Note the three generations here. The first generation is Lois, the grandmother, the second generation is Eunice, the mother of Timothy. And the third is 
Timothy himself. I am so glad to see James Gaba, a millennial, being raised by God in GCF field as a deacon, as a leader among the youth. I'm also glad to see Sherwin Dimla, another millennial who is being raised by God in GCF York as a deacon, and also Pastor James Julanda, GCF York, as a pastor of worship of children's ministry and the future church planter, GCF New Market. It's great to see the millennials become next-gen leaders in our churches. But here's what I'd like for us to imagine. Wouldn't it be more exciting to see James Kaba have his next generation leader, Sherwin Dimla, to have his own next generation leader, and Pastor James to also have his next generation leader and pastor? That would be mentoring with depth. Now, in the Imaginative Hope booklet, we see that there is an encouraging reality about the next generation, which is this. This generation, referring to the young adults, referring to the youth, is capable of leading. Listen to this exhortation. This generation has willing and able leaders who are already leading on social media, sports teams, bands, business startups, and in their schools, but rarely in the church. We need to intentionally invest in these young leaders, allowing them to lead in the church and empowering them to see the difference they can make in the world for the sake of the kingdom. We need to give young people real leadership opportunities and listen to their dreams. My friend, let's mentor with depth the next generations. And the best way for us to mentor them with depth is to allow them to lead. So far, we've seen that the first way to leave a legacy that lasts is to minister with grace. And then we are also called to mentor with depth. The next way we are to do it is to model through hardship. This is what verse three says. The modeling in leaving a legacy that lasts involves enduring hardship together. This is what verse three states. Paul says, join with me, referring again to Timothy, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. I'd like for you to note that suffering and hardship are part of our ministry. Suffering and hardship are part of our mentoring. To leave a godly heritage, we need to model a life in the midst of suffering and hardship. When we even look at the model of Paul, he reveals his hardships in the ministry as he suffers as a prisoner for the sake of Christ and for the gospel. Now in chapter 2, the first part of verse 9, he states these words, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Paul also suffered hardship when people he ministered to deserted him. As seen in chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, at my first defense, no one came to my support. But everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. Now, here are some of the people that he mentored who deserted him. We see in chapter 1, verse 15, you know that everyone in the province of Asia deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. We also see in chapter 4, verse 10, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me. We also see how hurt he was, though he was ministering with all his heart and time to others, particularly Alexander. Look at what he says of Alexander. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. And then he mentions about him again in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander whom I have handed over to Satan 
to be taught not to blaspheme. Now, with despite all his sufferings, despite his various hardships, despite the distortions by people he ministered and mentored, what I see exciting and encouraging in this passage is that Paul still experienced the faithfulness of God. We see these words from Paul that despite the faithfulness of people, God was faithful. In chapter 4, verse 17 and verse 18, we see these words. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, and I was delivered from the lion's den. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. As a result of the faithfulness of God in his life, despite the faithlessness of others toward his life, Paul modeled faithfulness in proclaiming the gospel, in not just guarding, but in sharing this trust that was given to him. We see this in chapter 4, verse 17, in the middle portion. Paul says, so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Now, in addition, Paul was about to be martyred. He sensed that in 2 Timothy, he was about to experience the end of his life. We sense this in chapter 4, verse 6, and when he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my depart for my departure is near. It's a wording, a euphemism of his death using the words departure. Even though he knew he was about to die, Paul still was saying, I'm fighting the good fight. I'm keeping the faith. We see these words in chapter 4, verse 7. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And what I find encouraging is that he also prepares Timothy for suffering that he was to go through. He was preparing Timothy for his own hardship that would come his way. And then he instructs Timothy to also fight the good fight the way he, Paul, fought his good fight. And two times he said to Timothy, fight the good fight. Let's go to the first. In 1 Timothy 1, 18, Paul says, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command so that by recalling them, you might fight the battle well. And second, uh, the second instance is when Paul told Timothy, Fight the good fight of the faith. Now, doing the passing of the baton of faith to our next generation involves hardship. Passing the baton of faith to the next generation involves suffering. It may even mean that some of the youth or young adults may fall off. I hope that this does not happen in our church. But in the hemorrhaging faith, report that research why youth and young adults are staying, leaving, or returning to church. It tells us four kinds of youth and young adults in Canada, and they are as follows. The first is called the engagers, 23% of those who were surveyed. So most young adults who are in church on Sundays are called engagers. Almost all engagers report having experienced the love of God, and it also reported answers to their own prayer. They're more likely to be female than male. Engagers generally report having opportunities to serve and lead in their local church, and maybe also even attended Christian camps and went to mission trips. The second kind of youth and young adult in Canada is what is called the fence, the fence sitter. And 36% of those surveys said they actually are in this category. Only a minority of fence sitters attend church on a regular basis, but their attitudes toward church are still somewhat positive. They don't read the Bibles regularly for themselves, but they may still pray. Their parents 
have likely been inconsistent in their patterns of church attendance and in their own practice of spiritual disciplines. They may still want church, but they want church on their own terms. So let's go to the third. The third are called wanderers. Wanderers are 26% of those who were surveyed. Now the wanderers have left, have left the church building, but they have not yet shaken the dust off their feet. The parents are likely to have stopped attending church, thus bringing their own attendance to a halt. They find church moral, moral teaching incompatible with their lifestyle and are almost never attending church. Wanderers think church has a positive role to play in society, not just for their own lives. And the fourth are called the rejectors. They are 15% of those who were surveyed. The rejectors are cynical about the motivations of Christians. They reject Christian moral teachings and find the church judgmental and unaccepting. The parents of most rejectors never consistently lived out their Christian faith before their children. For rejectors, the church is out of touch and attendance in church is pointless. And here's my hope for GCF. By God's grace, may Green Hills Christian Fellowship see more of our youth and young adults become engagers more than any of the other three. And the way for us to leave such a long legacy of engagers is to minister with grace. The second is to mentor with depth. And third is to model through hardship. Amen.